Good morning. Okay. Oh, now I have to hook this again. Okay, we're good. Good morning. How do you feel after losing an hour's sleep? You should have seen the early service. <laughs> As you see, there were not very many of them at 8.30. They were, yeah, yeah, everybody. It's amazing how you feel when you know you've lost an hour of sleep and you had no control over it. So on the windowsills, you will find that we've added three more names for Jesus that show up in the Gospel of John, chapters 5 through 7. It's the Savior of the world, the Bread of Life, and the Holy One of God. So using Robbie Gallaty's study called Knowing Jesus, Living by His Name, we're moving through John's Gospel for this Lenten season. We're traveling with Jesus and his disciples from his baptism in the Jordan River all the way through to this impromptu breakfast um, that they had on the shore of the Sea of Galilee following his resurrection. Last week, we walked through chapters 1 through 4, and today we're going to look at chapters 5 through 7, spending the most amount of time in chapter 6. John wrote a lot, we learned last week, John wrote a lot about the signs that Jesus enacted. And he specifically didn't use the word miracle. You find the word miracle in the other Gospels, but not so much in the Gospel of John. He uses the word signs because he saw every miracle as a sign pointing to, uh, the, to Jesus' true salvation-bringing, life-giving identity. So allow me to remind us of the purpose statement that John wrote in chapter 20. And let's read this together. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. In chapter 5, Jesus healed a man who had been crippled for 38 years. And you would think that everybody would be happy about that, but that was not the case. The religious leaders were incensed by this because Jesus had healed the man on the Sabbath, a strict day of rest for the Jews. So in chapter 5, verse 18, John wrote this. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So already in chapter 5, the tensions are high between Jesus and between the religious leaders. And he said to, him, said to them, and of course this didn't help much either, he said, and the father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His vo voice you've never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet re you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. That's how he addressed the religious leaders. Now remember from last week that there were three different types of people that Jesus encountered. He encountered unbelievers. He encountered believers who really just came to believe because of the signs that they had seen him do. And disciples, those who had entrusted their lives to Jesus and that he in turn entrusted the fullness of his identity to them. And the disciples, they're in the thick of it. So when we begin in chapter 6, there is a problem that is identified. Jesus has become very, very popular. And the crowds, jeez, and the crowds, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Goodness gracious. Let's try that. Don't move, right? <laughs> I have to move. So the, the crowds had become so large, and the disciples were exhausted. In fact, in Mark's telling of this particular event, Jesus said, um, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure time even to eat. They had been peopled to death people and more people and more people and more people. 
And so they got in a boat and they crossed the sea to go over to Bethsaida where they were going to rest and maybe rejuvenate their tired spirits. That was the idea. But the way the geography is, the people could see where they were going. The people saw that they were headed over to Bethsaida. And so they just, I mean, the Sea of Galilee is not that large, folks. And so they ran around the perimeter so that by the time Jesus and the disciples got there, they were already waiting for them. And so let's read what happened next. This is John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. So after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when he looked up, he saw this large crowd coming toward him. And Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Now he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. And one of the disciples then, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? So Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets." Now, we've heard this story, you know, so many times in Sunday school and throughout our years as, as church attenders, many of us. But let's just ask God to show us something new in this story. I want us to back up to Jesus' question. And remember from our sermon series before Lent started, the questions of Jesus, we remember that Jesus didn't ask questions because he was trying to find out something that he didn't know. I mean, Jesus knows everything. Jesus is God. But Jesus asked questions to get us to stop and think and reflect and ultimately to to draw us closer to our Father who is in heaven. In fact, if you remember, in, in that text, John wrote, after Jesus asked this question, he said this, that he said this to test him because he knew himself what he was gonna do. He was testing his disciples by this question, trying to get him to think about their faith. So here's the question. Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat. Where are we to buy bread, Philip, for all these people to eat? Now, the disciples had seen numerous signs by this point. Some of them were already believers. Some of them were already disciples. And some weren't there yet. And we find out a little bit later in chapter 6. But none of them, not one of them, could deny that Jesus had a power that none of them had. There was power in him that they did not have. So, Philip is the first one, and he doesn't really answer Jesus' question. He just gives some facts. He says six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little bit. So he's one of those guys, he's looking over the crowd, he's calculating a little bit, he's got maybe, you know, one of those brains that like to add things up, and, you know, he sees the crowd, he's doing the math. And then Andrew spoke up, and Andrew said, well, this, there's a boy over here who's got five loaves of barley bread and, and, and two fish, which sounds like maybe, you know, he's got some faith going on. It sounds like a, a much better statement than, than Philip has just made. But then he takes a complete nosedive because then he says, but what are they among so many people? What are they among so many people? Here's what happened. Philip looked at what they didn't have. He knew that they didn't have enough money to buy bread for all these people, and Andrew only looked at what they had in their hands. Philip looked at what they didn't have, and Andrew only looked at what they had in their hands. There was no way that they were going to be able to feed all of these people, 5,000 men, and plus women and children, probably at least 10,000 people. In Mark's account, we read that the disciples said to Jesus, send them away out to the surrounding countryside and let them get themselves something to eat. They just wanted to to avoid the problem. They just wanted it to go away. 
which is what we do sometimes. Maybe if we ignore something, it'll just go away. Listen to this from Psalm 55, 6. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, I could fly away and be at rest. Or in Jeremiah 9, 2. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people and go away from them. Oh, that I had a cabin in the woods that I could just go away and hide from everybody. So we learn that avoidance of problems is not new, folks. It's been going on for a long time. But if you're on the leadership team, and there's at least 10,000 people looking to you for an answer, what are you going to do? Well, let's look at what they didn't do. They didn't look to Jesus to answer the problem. They didn't look to him because they still had a defective view of Jesus. Well, sure, he can turn water into wine and he can heal the sick, but to feed 10,000 people with five loaves and two fish, hmm. Their understanding of who Jesus was was so defective, it was so lowball that they did not even consider that Jesus might have been asking this question to test their faith. Where are we to buy bread for all of these people to eat? Thomas Carlyle, who is a Scottish historian, he wrote this, that men are like the gods they serve. We live our lives according to the concept of the God to whom we bow. Which just took me to J.B. Phillips' book um, written 40 years ago called Your God is Too Small. Is our concept, is your concept of God too small? Have we limited God's work in our lives because of our limited faith? Jesus asked Philip, where are we to buy bread for all of these people to eat? And wouldn't it have been wonderful if Philip would have said, we believe that you can provide what these people need, Lord. Just tell us what to do. Wouldn't that have been wonderful? We believe that you can provide what they need. Just just tell us what to do. And then the solution to this problem came in a miraculous display of power. This miracle is the most public of all the miracles that Jesus performed. It's the only miracle that is is, um, recorded in all four Gospels. So first he told the disciples to get all the people to sit down. Think about it. 10,000 people got everybody to sit down. And then he took the loaves. How many loaves? Five loaves, two fish. Okay, then he took the loaves, you know, and he, he, he gave thanks for the bread that they had, even though everybody could see that they did not have enough food. And so as he's given thanks, you know, people, I guess, are supposed to bow their heads, and it just made me think about, you know, kids around a dinner table when you're praying, and they're also sometimes peeking to see what's going on and see maybe what's for dinner and whether they want to eat it or not, called peek and pray, right? And I think that those people were probably peeking while they were praying because they didn't want to miss anything. And they came, they ran all the way around the perimeter of the sea because they knew that Jesus was the miracle worker and they did not want to miss anything. And they were not disappointed because every time a disciple reached into a basket for more bread, there was more bread. And every time a disciple reached into a basket for more fish, there was more fish there. And can you imagine like this, this rising rumble of amazement among the people? They started talking as they began to see that everybody was getting food. Everybody was getting what they needed. And then just, you know, what, what might have exploded when they realized that not only did everybody have their fill, but there were leftovers. Knowing Jesus living by his name, living by his name, means that we are living our lives true to to who Jesus has revealed himself to be. Living by his name means that we are living our lives true to who he has revealed himself to be. 
And for some of us, that means breaking some of the chains that we've put on ourselves. For some of us, it means breaking out of the box that maybe we've put around us that, that makes us think that God is so small. Or maybe an unwillingness on our part to accept the truth claims that Jesus made about himself. Jesus declared in the most amazing way, in the most dramatic way, that no matter what we give to him, no matter even if it's the smallest thing, no matter what it is, he can use it. He can use it. And it reminded me of that old gospel song, Little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. And I think it's harder for us to give our weaknesses to God than it is to give our strengths to God. I mean, maybe, you know, we're good at speaking or we're good at organizing or we're good maybe with kids or we're good with technology. And so it's easy to take these strengths and say to God, God, take my gifts and use them for your glory. But to give God our weaknesses, to give God our insecurity or our sense of loneliness or our fears of this or that, or our lack of faith to give him these things feels like we are giving him a measly five loaves and two fish when there's so many needs out there that our strengths could tackle. That's harder. But what it boils down to really is pride. And I think that many of us have maybe missed, we, we've not noticed the miraculous works that God is doing in our lives because of this. Even a God who knows everything about, it, about us, even a God who has proven his love for us by dying on a cross, we don't want to tell him how we're struggling. We don't want to tell him how we're even struggling in the, with believing in the fullness of his name. We just rather push it away and tell everybody there's nothing to see here and then just go on slogging through the mud, feeling quite alone. Isaiah 30, 18 declares this. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. And he rises off of his throne to show you compassion. I mean, the way that Jesus showed compassion to all of those hungry people, the Lord longs to show you compassion in the area of your greatest weakness. Listen to these beautiful words from missionary and author Elizabeth Elliot. If the only thing you have to offer is a broken heart, you offer a broken heart. So in a time of grief, the recognition that this is material for sacrifice for me, she writes, has been a very great strength to me. Realizing that nothing I have, nothing I am, will be refused on the part of Christ, I simply give it to him as the little boy gave Jesus his five loaves and two fishes with the same feeling of the disciples when they said, what is the good of that for such a crowd? Naturally, in almost anything I offer to Christ, my reaction would be, what is the good of that? But the point is, the use he makes of it is none of my business. It is his business. It is his blessing. So this grief, this loss, this suffering, this pain, whatever it is, which at the moment is God's means of testing my faith and bringing me to the recognition of who he is, that is the thing that I can offer. I just think that's astounding. So if you say that you have nothing to give, then give that. Because your nothing, plus God, is everything. Your nothing plus God, folks, is everything. So what happens after this? After the feeding of these 10,000 people, oh, you know, just the usual stuff, Jesus walking on water. <laughs> Jesus standing and saying, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry again, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Imagine that. And then he, he continued to teach his, you know, the unbelievers and the believers and his disciples. And, and he declared that whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 
And in the meantime, the chief priests and the Pharisees have sent officers already to go and arrest Jesus. They've already sent them. But they didn't do it. These officers came back empty-handed. And at the end of chapter 7, we read this. Why did you not bring him? Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like this man. And here we meet up with Nicodemus again. He's trying to calm down the other Pharisees, and he said, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And we see this all of the time and more and more and more in our, in our country. There are so many who say that they do not believe in the claims of Jesus, but they don't even know what he's claimed. They've never read a book about him. They've never opened the Bible to read anything about him. Does our law judge a man without first hearing what he has to say and, and seeing what he does? Long day after long day after long day, Jesus is revealing to the people around him who he is. But if you're just like one of the Pharisees, if all you're doing is looking for something to complain about, if all you're doing is looking for something to, to pick apart, then when you look down in your hands, you're going to find nothing but crumbs and dried bones. Nicodemus was trying to get his fellow Pharisees to do more than just look at Jesus, see him. To do more than just hear Jesus, listen to him. And to do more than just judge Jesus, investigate his claims. See him, listen to him, investigate his claims. Because when we do all that, folks, I believe with all of my heart that we will say, as those officers said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Because he's not just a man. He's God in human flesh. Fully human and fully divine. Come to save us once and for all. For abundant life here on earth and for eternal life in heaven. And so this week I challenge you to read in the Gospel of John, chapters 5 through 7. Three chapters. Read chapters 5 through 7, and then take a pencil or a highlighter or whatever you want to use and go and read it again and mark any of those verses that really just stand out to you. Choose one verse that you can memorize. And while you're doing all that, pray. Pray that God would give you an opportunity to share what you are learning with somebody that God brings into your path. I challenge us all to be committed to our mission, to being and making disciples of Jesus Christ as we dig into knowing Jesus and living by his name. Thanks be to God. Amen.